Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Matt Oates. I'm the person who's been emailing you and spamming you all the time. Um, and, and I want to start off really by thanking everyone for coming here tonight. Uh, we've got a really good turnout, and I can see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of excited faces too, which is absolutely great. Um, so thank you for coming to ECHO's very first event for GPs. The future is now digital technology for NHS general practice. Um, so I want to explain a little bit why we put this event together and why we've got you all under one roof. So the idea behind this event was to get general practitioners, actual practicing clinicians, and everyone else in primary care exposed to the tech startup world, and especially the startups that are trying to innovate in the health tech uh, sphere. And we really wanted to create something that was practical and not too far-fetched. So we wanted to present and showcase all the startups developing tools for you that you can use today in your consulting rooms or in your administrative workflows. So that's the idea behind the event, and uh, thanks so much for taking up the invitation and coming here today. So a couple of points, just housekeeping. If you want to tweet, if that's your thing, then we've got a hashtag. It's echo underscore digital GP. And if you'd like to um, add a few hashtags in there, I'm all ready with that, but if you want to add hashtag NHS, hashtag health tech, it adds to the exposure as well. Um, live streaming the event, Abena is going to be doing that, so everyone who is not here, they can follow on the Medic Footprints page. Please press like and follow the page, and that way you'll be exposed to the live stream. You'll notice uh, Tom's running around taking photos, please smile at him, he's doing a great job. Um, and yes, yeah, so please enjoy yourselves, and at the end of the drinks reception, please come and say hello to us, come say hello to the team, um, and all the other teams from the other startups. We're trying to set up conversations and create something uh, really unique and different. We're trying to create a community here that uh, accepts that the NHS can be fixed uh, in as many different ways as possible with technology. So without much further ado, and uh, I'll let all the presenters pre present themselves and then introduce themselves. We're starting off with uh, Dr. Belinda Croker. Good evening, hi. All right. How many of you are GPs here? Oh, just put your hands up. Great, wonderful. Okay, it's great to see so many GPs here because, you know, if Obviously, this, this event is for GPs. It's, it's, about, it's about technologies that have been developed to help us work better, to work more smarter, to work more efficient, and to deal with some of the frustrations that we've had to deal with for years. So it's brilliant to see you here. And I'm really pleased to be part of this lineup. Um, we've got some amazing startups here, um, and particularly because all the startups today have been founded by uh, frontline clinicians. And also, over half of the co-founders are female, which is brilliant. So, um, so that's a, that's really positive. Um, so the reason, well, I, I've labelled my well, a title that unfortunately hasn't come out very well. Um, my my talk as Let's Play. Um, and just to go into my background, I'm a GP. I've been a GP for eight and a half years now, and I've been a doctor for fifteen years. Um, and I've been a portfolio GP. Um, pretty much since the beginning of my career. Started off in commissioning and service design um, and in quality, so I worked, worked in local CCGs or um, PCTs as they were back then. Um, and then worked in um, NHS England and in GP performance and quality. Um, uh, completed an MBA and then became medical director of GP Out of Hours uh, company in South East London. So I was on the board of directors at that company and senior manager. Um, and then since then I've been uh, kind of doing a portfolio, or my portfolio has included being a GMC GP expert witness, testing um, apps and um, providing clinical advice to startups. Um, and now I'm commercial director of uh, One Health Tech. Um, and so the reason I'm saying let's play is that I really want to urge and encourage all the GPs here and any clinicians to really get involved, uh, get involved with this, and, it's digital transformation, isn't it? It's, it's, it's making all of these technologies work for us. Um, so we don't want to just kind of have all this change and it, and we, and it runs ahead of us. Um, we want to be able to make it work for us so that we can use it and it can actually positively change our work. 
Um, if you just think about your iPhone and, you know, I mean, I often leave my house just with my iPhone and keys and lip gloss because I can pay, I can pay, um, you know, get everyone else and pay using my iPhone. I can do my banking using my iPhone. It's amazing. So, so let's just try and make, you know, make this work for us. So I was recently, about three months ago, I was contacted by a, <clears throat> um, by a CEO of a startup um, who wanted me to invest or to invest in his early stage startup. So he sent a slide deck and as I'm, I mean, I'm not an investor, um, but you know, I was curious. Uh, so I opened up the slide deck and this is, kind of what came up. So it was like 20 slides of, and the first seven slides were like this, so it was just a lot to see. Um, <clears throat> so I closed it, and I thought, no, um, I, can't, I can't, you know, it's a lot to read, um, I'm, not quite, I'm not sure about this. Then about two weeks later, I went back, because uh, I was curious, so I just kind of got a cup of tea and just decided to read through it. And actually, the product was, I could see it really being useful for GPs. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it could be useful, and there were a few things that were worried me. And one of them was that, uh, I mean, again, you have to kind of read the small print, but it said research published in the journal of something showed that these tests could be used to deter detect certain cancers early. Um, and to, and to um, help diagnose the disease uh, before people display symptoms. To me, that's screening and diagnosis of cancer, and we don't use that, that test in that way. Um, and it might come up soon, but I'm not aware of that. And there wasn't any references in the document. Uh, it was just not right. And, and, and actually, as in, you know, if, if I was to invest, actually at that point, I would have just not, not bothered. I would just be not have trust, trusted this particular uh, startup, and that would have been it. But I felt that I had to provide some feedback because potentially it could be useful, uh, useful for us. So I sent my feedback to this uh, founder, uh, to the CEO, and this is his response to me. He said, "Oh my goodness, thank you so so much." Because I think he was quite surprised that I actually got back to him. So if everyone has been as, as helpful and incitive, uh, insightful and informative as you, I'd be months ahead. And I thought that's really obvious. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, for, for a product that's going to be sold to or used by clinicians, that you would want a clinician to provide you with some advice or to, you would want them to be part of the process, uh, part of the, either delivering the service or, or you want some feedback from them. So for me, it was very, very obvious, but actually there are a lot of uh, startups, there are a lot of founders that don't have clinical backgrounds that come up with some really good ideas. I don't know how they, they understand the problems that we face, but they're really trying hard to help us. So in a way, we, we should help them to help us. So what I'd like to see more of is this. Um, and Giles is here, Dr. Giles Morrison. He um, is clinical UX um, specialist, and, and actually, um, I mean, it's, it's a bit of an adaptation from one of his um, adverts, but this is about including users in, in the design of products, in the design of service, in the design of, um, of, of whatever is needed to solve the problems um, that we are coming across. So it's like, okay, let's make your life easier. Come along, we're gonna give you a good time, it's gonna be relaxing, but also, you know, we're gonna give you a bit of payment. Um, come along and be part of it. And so that's really what I want you to do, is, is, to, is to look out for these type of things. You can, I mean, I've attended startups themselves, but also done a lot of work remotely, just getting involved, because you get to play, you get to, you get to really just put in all these different clinical scenarios into these apps. And they're amazing, and, and you get to validate them, and you get to be part of this process that, that's actually going to change the way you work. So I just want to urge you all to be part of it. And last but not least, this is One Health Tech. This is us. 
We are a network um, that's growing networks, so and now it's about 11,000 members, and we're all across the UK, and we're about to set up in Ireland, and hopefully in parts of Europe, uh, Europe soon. So we promote um, and support women and diversity uh, in, in healthcare, uh, health innovation, um, and health tech. So uh, we have a number of uh, events, and we hold uh, similar to hackathons like collaborathons. We we um, we're just really there to help promote success in in, in health tech. So please join us. Uh, this is our website, onehealthtech.com. Be part of it. Uh, and yeah, we're a nutty bunch. These are our founders, Lou and Louis Sinclair and Maxine McIntosh. Um, really great bunch of people. So yeah, it would be good to see you in one of our events. Thank you. After each talk, is we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So if anyone's got a question now, a talk for Belinda. Right. Uh, go ahead. What's the most fun that you've had when um, reviewing an app that may include the app being really bad? I don't know. But what's the most fun you've had in reviewing an app or some digital? Most fun. Um, the particular app. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had a lot of fun testing the uh, AI chatbot. Babylon. Um, the whole experience was, was good, just actually <coughs> visiting premises, um, meeting so many people that are actually happy, <laughs> happy at work. <laughs> it's quite a nice thing to see. <laughs> uh, yeah, the environment, it's, it's different. <laughs> um, but also, you know, we were treated very well. Um, we really got to play around, put in all these different scenarios. Um, I mean, this, you know, it's, it's evolved quite a bit even since, since then. But actually, this AI chatbot has you know, uh, the, you know, it really has the potential to make a difference to to, uh, to triage in general practice and in 111, so really positive things to see. That was good fun. Thank you. All right, so next up we have Dr. Serena Chibber. Uh, Serena is with my local manager, and I'll let her tell her own story, so I'd much further ado. Here's Serena. Yeah, so, yeah, so this forward backwards. So hi everyone, um, it's really nice to have been asked to come and speak to you all today. Um, my name is Serena and I'm co-founder of um, the popular <coughs> toolkit, My Locum Manager, which essentially was the start of my vision to make locum life um, a more digital process. So um, my journey into health tech began quite accidentally um, a couple of years ago when I finished my GP training. And it felt so good, like after you know being a junior doctor, doing my GP training to finish, and I kind of thought my life was going to be a lot like this. You know, I thought I was going to be really cool and confident. I was my own person now. No one's going to tell me which rotors I have to work. Um, and I was also going to have a lot of fun. And then I found, when I was branching out into the world of independent practice and locum GP work, that my life was a little bit more like this. And um, I found that actually it was quite a um, stressful process going from a GP trainee to becoming an independent practitioner. I found that I had to ask around a lot for advice, you know, how do I do this, um, how am I supposed to do this? Um, and from somebody who was quite used to kind of knowing what to do and, and how to get on with things, um, I, I was left feeling quite daunted. And then I actually started working, and um, I think many of us would agree that as doctors we have very little financial education. <coughs> So I got a real fright when I got my first tax bill because I'd actually spent all my money and I had this huge tax bill to pay. Um, and I just found the whole process like really confusing. And I used like you know other things that people were using at the time, but I felt like it didn't really meet my needs and it didn't actually make my life easier. So then I started to do a bit of research and um, I found that actually a lot of local GPs had a very similar problem. They had problems getting started, the know-how and, and how they're gonna work safely and independently. And also, they all seem to find, as I did, there was a real disconnection in the processes of working as an independent doctor. And, and that kind of got me thinking. And so I kind of worked to look at the market and see what needs weren't being met by other products that were available. And then we then designed a, a toolkit and using health, te te health te te technology even um, to kind of address those needs. And um, our vision at that time was to create a digital toolkit 
which would take someone from a very nervous um, locum GP to be, being a um, financially independent, um, self-employed business person. And that was phase one of our business, and we had a wider vision that we then wanted to work <coughs> towards. So I became the first user of the site. Um, since then, it, it's expanded um, quite exponentially. And um, I just wanted to talk to you a bit about what my benefits were. Um, and I know it's a health tech talk, and it's all about health technology, and that is a health tech toolkit that I've set up. But actually, my benefits um, as a user were very different um, to the functionality. So I found it gave me back confidence. It really helped to support me in my process of working independently. But it gave me back a really important commodity, which was time. So other than being co-founder and being a GP, I'm also a mother of two kids, and time is a very valuable resource that I have. And I just found that using the site to manage my life essentially meant I had more time to do the things that I, I genuinely enjoyed and, um, and genuinely wanted to spend time doing. Now then, moving over to being a co-founder of the site, again, um, it's been a really, really wonderful opportunity. I've had the chances to work with lots of other companies that are doing wonderful things in the general practice sector, and it's been a huge amount of fun, built a lot of connections, and our site has grown rapidly, and as it has done, I've had a lot more opportunities, one of those being being part of the NHS England Clinical Innovation Scheme. So when I was invited to come and talk here, I messaged a cohort of our users, and um, I just said, I've been asked to do this health tech talk, you know, can you guys just give me some of the benefits you're getting from the site? And I thought they were going to talk about some of the cool buttons we have, the user interface, and all the, all the other things we're really proud of. Um, but instead, I got this in my inbox. So I'm just going to share a bit of it. So the site kind of helps promote financial empowerment. And for that, some people felt that it made them more financially savvy, be it through their holiday money or be it through one of our users. She's one of our oldest users, and she's a very experienced locum, said it helps contribute to her honeymoon fund. Um, other users, as a self-employed doctor, if you want basic things like you want to get a mortgage and all those kinds of things, you need to get a lot of paperwork together. And the site, again, does that all for you. You don't actually have to do anything if you're using it. It's going to automatically do it. And the other one I got, which I included, the subject heading in my email box was Bye Bye Boring. And it basically said, Serena, essentially I've managed to say bye bye to boring, laborious tasks and get on with other things that I enjoy. So as I said, I'm a GP, and there's many GPs and doctors here today, and I really feel that actually we're really well-placed at innovating in healthcare technology and in the NHS. Systems in the NHS are often very set in their ways, and we have been um, part of that process through our training and through our work. Therefore, the knowledge that we have is really important for leading the way for change. Also, as doctors, um, where I think we're all geared up to, to have your own startup because it involves, as I learn, um, also as a parent, that it involves uh, very long hours. Sometimes I, I would be working until 1 a.m. on the business, um, sleepless nights, and dealing with a lot of bugs, which, um, other than kind of the bugs of my two year old, um, I was introduced to a new set of bugs when we launched the site. <laughs> My main learning point really has been that using technology is really about creating benefits, um, which then create value. And the ethos we've used from the very beginning is to build what people want. And actually, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for all the users saying, look, this will be really useful, this will be really useful, and then we built and built and built. We started very small with this basic concept, um, and, but we thought big. And we have a hugely exciting um, months ahead now because we're launching a number of large-scale ventures which are going to innovate in general practice in sectors which haven't been innovated in before. So I definitely say um, watch this space. Um, and I say if you're a doctor and you're thinking of innovating in some way, I think you all have the skill base to do it. So I think in order, I think being like a mother of two is probably the hardest job I've ever done. Because the sleepless nights and everything else kind of, like they're like my CEOs or like, you know, the people I have to report back to. So they're really like probably the hardest job. But then I think definitely because it's my own thing and whatever I put into it is what we get out. And I think I feel like a lot of responsibility. So 
actually a lot of people are like, oh, weren't you nervous, like self-funding it? <coughs> but I wasn't really nervous about that. I think what, I'm, what causes me sleepless nights is I just want every user that we have to find it really useful. So that's what's been my main driver. So I think it is really hard work. Like in the beginning, we were working till um, like 1 a.m. a lot of days. Um, to get everything ready and to you know build on it, and then you'd have bugs, and you'd be like, oh God, I you know need to deal with this. Um, so I think it's harder than general practice, but it's definitely more rewarding because I sometimes feel that it's great being a GP, but it can be quite a thankless task sometimes. And this way, I feel like I'm driving something forward, um, and I think that's quite a unique opportunity. So yeah, so hard, but maybe not as hard as having a two and a four year old. <laughs> So yeah, that's a really interesting question. So in terms of the the site as it was, um, we already had our vision for that. But I think this next stage that we're launching into is something that they've helped to lay some of the foundations for, and also in terms of the mentorship, etc. Because I've never run a business before, and um, so that was a shock. Like you know, kind of learning learning all that process um, was very were very difficult, but it's been quite nice to bounce off ideas from experienced people that know how the NHS sector works or have had experience in business to say, oh no, you need to register with Companies Health, and I'm like, what, what's that? <laughs> uh, okay. So, you know, things like that. So that it's been really useful from different perspectives, but um, it has been useful in terms of mentorship, and I think when we're going through our training and learning, sometimes you just kind of ask other people around you, but it's quite nice to ask someone who's been there, done that, who can then kind of reflect back and really help you grow. And there's another <coughs> hand around here that I... We've got one of. over there that's gone yes. up. Hi. Hi. When you could do it all again, um, <laughs> obviously you have the same idea of the uh, concept, what would you have done differently? Um, I think, that's a really good question. Um, so I think it was a process, so I think it's good we started small, and I think a lot of the things that are coming are going to be a natural involvement of the site, and I think had we launched that in the beginning, we would have been really overwhelmed. So I think um, my personal lessons would have been not to be so hard on myself, because I think sometimes when it's your own thing, you really kind of, you know, you just take ownership for it, and maybe you just kind of don't applaud yourself for the little steps that you make. And, um, and also don't let your children, when you're testing all the wireframes and stuff, just keep them away from the computer. Because when they press delete, <coughs> it's a really stressful process trying to get all that information there. But I think time management would have been a really good lesson to just set small goals for myself, not try and do too much at the same time. And um, to just, uh, yeah, just to put a little bit less pressure on myself um, and just take it a little bit slower. Thank you so much, Sarita. Thank you. I think we'll pause questions for now. Um, next up, we have our very own uh, Dr. George Cherry. Um, what I'm going to say going forward from now on to all the rest of the speakers, if a uh, question comes in, repeat it so that everyone at home listening to the live stream uh, gets to understand the question as well. And then, uh, yeah, then, then they can contribute. But George, come on up. Hello, <coughs> hello. George, obviously from Echo, and as you might expect, putting on the event, you couldn't escape without a talk from us. Um, so, very briefly, I was a junior doctor before, and then I started working part-time at Echo, um, and it's sort of spiraled out of control, and I'm now one of the product managers there. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how, sort of, why Echo was started, um, a little bit about, um, kind of, how, how it works, uh, and then a little bit about why it's, kind of, maybe a benefit or, kind of, use, things that are useful to you know, for you to know as general practitioners. So, these guys. This is Stephen and Sai. Um, they, uh, a few years ago, were both uh, introduced out of a mutual frustration with the way that um, obtaining their repeat prescriptions were. They're very average guys, including the fact that like 50% of people <coughs> over the age of 35, they take a repeat prescription. Um, and they found every time they went to get that, they had to go um, ring the pharmacist, ring the GP, who would then speak to a receptionist who wouldn't have it ready. Then they tell them it was ready, they go to the pharmacy, and they'd be like, oh, no, no, we haven't got it ready, you need to come back tomorrow. And it was just a completely um, fragmented system that was wasting lots of time for them. Um, and so they decided to do something about it. So for those of you that don't take a repeat prescription, or for those of you that kind of want to understand how the system perhaps ended up getting like this, I'm going to briefly show you um, kind of my interpretation of why it's ended up like this. And it's based on two kind of concepts, so want and need. 
So most things you'll ever do in your life, most tasks are kind of based on like the things you want to do, the things you need to do. And there's a kind of spectrum to it's everything you'll need to do. Everything you have to do sits somewhere on this spectrum. So for instance, um, video games, you don't really need to do those at all, but you might really want to, hence why it's a very massive industry. Um, paying your taxes, you don't feel like you need to do them, the government wants you to, but you kind of really feel you need to, and you definitely don't want to do them. So the way that that's architected in the world is that it's done automatically, you don't have to think about it. Like on your pay slip, the taxes are just paid unless you're self-employed. Um, so that's the way the kind of world works, which is respect the tasks that sit there. There's things in the middle, I, the one I can think of feels like buying the Ford Fiesta, you don't really want it, but like you might need it, but like you'd rather have a Lamborghini, I don't know. Um, so that's kind of in the middle. Food is like the sweet spot in the corner, just like stuff that you really, really want and you need. Like try going without eating, it's really hard. Um, so stuff up there is like, it's not very hard to sell. So the final thing, healthcare. Traditionally healthcare down here, the need is overwhelming. Like people, like obviously, like, you know, if you're unwell, you can't go without it. However, you don't really want, no one wants to go to the hospital, no one wants to take medication. So that's the way the service is kind of set up. So it's kind of, it's more driven towards making it easy for the people providing it, not the people consuming it. So essentially, Echo, I guess the kind of mission in my mind anyway, is to try and turn this into something a bit more like the pizza. So just push it into something that you feel like you want to do, rather than stuff that you necessarily need to do. <coughs> so, what did they do about it? They made Echo. So this is our V3 app, which launched last week, and the Android app, which launched publicly last week as well. So we decided, so this kind of philosophy at Echo is kind of, of just making something with a very simple, clean design that's very easy to use, and supports people with a kind of good um, set of defaults, I guess, is a good way of putting it, rather than putting the onus on the patient to actually get everything set up, because that's not the people who are going to be disengaged with healthcare, it's the people who can't be bothered to set up all these reminders and things in the calendar and stuff like that. So how does Echo work? So you download the app, and you sign up, and we nominate you to one of our partner pharmacies, and you tell us what medication you take, and you say when you would like it, and we then request that from the GP, um, when that comes back to one of our partner pharmacies, we post it out to people. We automatically set up reminders for when you need to take them for individual doses, and then also when people are going to run out. Um, and then on the app, um, we also allow people to um, record when they take a medication, when they take a medication, um, uh, with, with feedback, so it can give them adherence reports to let them know how they're doing. Um, we also realised that the kind of need, essentially in the beginning, was for medication, but actually I guess it's more to just live a long, healthy life. So as part of that, we um, we like we we um, presented uh, we developed some adherence functionality which lets people know how much of their medication they've taken and how they're doing with respect to their individual doses. So how are we doing? How do patients actually like? Um, echo uh, is it is it achieving the kind of goal of um, moving itself up towards the pizza and becoming something that people want rather than something they need? So net promoter score. So this is something which is um, a kind of uh, for those of you who don't know, I was a doctor before. I have no idea what this kind of terminology meant. This is something that's like um, a sort of score out of ten is whether you're going to um, tell your friends that you like uh, a product and you recommend it to them or that you won't. Um, so ours is seventy seven on the kind of iTunes rating score, which goes from minus one hundred to plus one hundred. Again, something I didn't know before which is pretty good, and it's kind of um, one of the best of any of the health gaps that we could find out there. Um, but more importantly, what do the um, patients actually think of it? So this is some of the feedback we've had on Twitter and other forms of social media, and is generally very positive. I encourage you, if you want to know a bit more about Echo, and if you don't really understand why it would be kind of useful people taking your prescription on the Twitter feed, Facebook, look at the iTunes store reviews, and just to get some kind of qualitative um, info about, like, about why uh, patients find it a benefit. Um, so to quickly kind of add a little bit onto the end, why it might be useful for um, you guys to be aware of this as general practitioners. So the, I guess the main thing is there's a fine line um, for people when they're taking the medication between being wasteful, so if they're completely, if they're reordering too often, like you have these sort of managed repeat systems that some pharmacies do, um, and then not taking it at all, so having low adherence. And we kind of find with Echo what we want to do is walk the tightrope somewhere in the middle. So we keep people adherent to their medication whilst at the same time not being wasteful and helping the NHS with the burden of medicines wastage. Um, and I think we're kind of getting along to achieving that aim now. Um, obviously what we need to do in the future is kind of raise a bit of awareness among, um, among GPs and help um, sort of looking forward in terms of like the way that now everything runs on fax machines and people phoning each other, emailing each other, kind of as we move towards more integrated service in the NHS, how we can kind of slot into that and make it very easy for you guys to manage repeat prescriptions. 
Um, so that's kind of where we're up to now. Um, and I think I'm pretty much there with respect to time, so I will um, finish on that note there and with time for questions. Ultimately, for us, it's just about making their experience better for patients. So anything we can do to kind of get requests for repeat prescriptions quicker to GPs and then sort of turn the um, electronic prescriptions around faster um, is really the way that we would like to move. Um, so that's the kind of high-level plan to kind of, I guess, if that answers the question. How are you managing to promote it to patients from places who do this medicine? Is it being promoted through GPs or pharmacists, or how, how do you get that communication to download people? Yeah, good question. So, I mean, we do um, some marketing mm -hmm. obviously to get it out there so people download it. Um, and then we also have kind of charity promoters. Some GPs who have got in contact have agreed to um, promote it just because they feel it's a benefit to their patients, um, just makes their lives easier. So, it's, it's a real mix of things, to be honest. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, so, the, George, that was a really good question, actually, but I couldn't quite hear it. Uh, if you're going to fit in the microphone, sorry, uh, just so everyone can hear it. Well. Uh, so that's basically how does it fit in with um, some of the CTGs banning third-party requests from um, people like pharmacies? Um, I think obviously with us it's, it's completely patient-led, so each time they make a request they have to check off which medication they want, like we don't, you know, what we're trying to do is tackle the medicines wastage. I mean obviously we have, like from the face of it, um, for those CCGs, the practice, the practice is there, it might seem uh, like we're requesting it sort of, you know, blindly without the, patients, without the patient knowing, like that's some bad practices out there, but often when we kind of communicate with them and we tell them what we're doing, they, a lot of them will see the benefit and actually can see that it's actually helping rather than kind of like worsening the problem. Um, so I guess just a case of explaining it to people and kind of making them aware of how it works. Uh, I think there's a question over there. Yeah. So how much difficult would a business be if you're not able to sell the grilled cream and the uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, How profitable would it be? Well, I mean, it's... Can you make money out of Yeah, yeah, I think we do. I mean, there's a business model, you know, behind that, which is... How much scale does that imply? Um, well, I mean, it's not like... <laughs> It's obviously, uh, some of those things are a little bit sensitive, but I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, given that we're going to do a funny round, but um, it's, uh, you know, it's, we, we, the way we work with pharmacies is that it's a kind of quid pro quo, so we win, they win, so um, yeah, it's on that basis, but I mean, obviously, if we do decide to sell real cream and condoms, that's going to help as well. But. <laughs> I think we'll do one last question from the gentleman over there. Who's shipping the product? Is it the nominated pharmacies in London? Um, and it is them the shipping it out. Um, and I think the reason for us really is for sort of going with a small amount is so we can do a kind of quality control element to that. So we have a sort of, you know, agreement with them that it will be um, picked and packed in a certain way. I mean, you saw the packaging there was quite nice to again help people kind of make it feel like it's something they want to do. Um, so that's sort of, yeah, that's kind of how it will go through there. But we do have obviously the operations team to help them out because we can't expect the pharmacy that will suddenly can't work to suddenly do this extra work. So we have a kind of team who help do the packing stuff so as well. Just one part, do, they, do the patients pay for the shipping? Uh, no, they don't pay. Unless they choose a kind of speedy option, but we just send everything out. So you only pay the same that you would pay otherwise for your NHS prescriptions. Right, so next up we have uh, Dr. Vishal Virani. Vishal works with uh, Come on up, Vishal. <laughs> right, so Vishal works with a called ADA, which has got a different tack to managing them on NHS. And again, it's another app that's uh, almost a sort of streamlined GP and primary care work. So I'll let Vishal take it from here. Thanks very much, Abdur. Um, oh, perfect. Brilliant. Yes, so. Um, thanks very much, Abdo. It's so great to see so many people here. It's very exciting. I mean, I think that um, 
this is a sign of things to come hopefully in terms of doctors and medical students engaging with technology. So my name is Michelle, I'm leading NHS Business Development at ADA. I'm also a co-founder at Doctorpreneurs, which some of you may have come across, sort of a community for medical entrepreneurs. You can have a look at our website, it's a free resource, we put on lots of interesting events and articles, and we've got an interesting event coming in November, which uh, we'll send details out to our mailing list soon. So in terms of, um, of ADA, we are the world's most advanced artificial intelligence powered symptom checker. And we also have an online consultation platform. So Ada itself, okay, here we go. So it's basically an app which is available on the App Store and Google Play, so you guys can download it, you know, have a play on it. The doctors amongst you will be curious to test it out and you know, let us know what you think. We've been developing the technology behind Ada for the last, for, since 2011. So for the first five years, Ada was just about a large group of doctors, engineers, software developers, putting together a very extensive knowledge base of conditions. And what that then translated to late last year was an app, a patient-facing app, which is, was launched globally and so far has been downloaded over a million times. And we've had about 1.3 million assessments done globally. And patients can put in one or more of their symptoms and they will then get asked a series of questions and there will then be a list of differential diagnoses with a probability attached to each diagnosis and also a triage suggestion for each diagnosis. So the idea here is that it's helping patients to understand what might be wrong with them so that they can then make the best decision about where they should go for their care. And it's also helping doctors to manage the demand that they might have as a GP practice or as a hospital, and also helping doctors to understand what might be going on with the patient. So it, it is also a decision support software, because we believe that you know, Ada has got enough information and knowledge to help doctors in that way. So we are most certainly not about replacing doctors. We're very much about working with doctors as a support, as a supportive tool. So this is just a story about you know, how it started. So I guess the key point here is we've been going, we were going for five years before we even launched the app. So it takes that long to put together this medical mm. knowledge base. And the way that works is that we have about over a thousand conditions with symptoms attached to each condition. And that's then gone into the system. And what we also have now with Ada is machine learning. Now I know lots of people talk about machine learning, but basically what that means is that we have two, two methods. One is a group of doctors within our team will look at a selection of the ADA assessments that are done and then um, look at the symptoms and they decide what they think the diagnosis should have been and the triage suggestion should have been and feed that back into ADA. And if ADA got it wrong, then it will teach ADA to improve for next time. And then we also look at all of those cases, um, and then we will use machine learning to basically pick out patterns from all of the cases that the different users have, have performed um, around the world, and then use that to pick out patterns and commonalities within the condition so that it can improve for next time. So that's sort of what, what the app is about. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about you know, how it could work in general practice, because I guess sort of the practical discussion about the technology is always very helpful. Um, so this is just a little bit more about the technology, which I've sort of explained to you guys. And the key point here is not a hard-coded petition tree, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. And therefore it can be used for a greater variety of conditions, and you can also be a little bit more secure as a doctor that, um, that the advice being given to yourself and to the patients is, is sort of accurate. This is just a brief note about the online consultations, um, you know, that's something that that will provide funding for CCDs and GP practices. It's something to be aware of and look out for for the GPs amongst you. Um, so in terms of the products, this is the app that I just talked about. We've also got Ada Pro, which is basically a web face, um, clinician facing web portal. So if you're a GP practice using Ada, then you push out the Ada app, encourage all of the patients that download it. If they then do an assessment and choose to share that assessment with the practice, that assessment will pop up on Ada Pro. And I know this is very small here, but what you see is basically a smart inbox, which will triage the assessments in terms of clinical urgency and also the time that they were received. And this, as a GP practice, allows you to manage your demand. So instead of everyone calling the, uh, the receptionist or everyone calling the telephone triage doctor or everyone coming to the front door demanding an appointment, you can use Ada to get an understanding of what your patients might have wrong with them and then decide what is the next best um, action. So it might be you decide
decide that this patient needs to be seen in person, so you bring them in. You might decide that you want to conduct an online consultation, and you can use Ada Pro's text chat service to conduct that online consultation within Ada Pro. You might decide that this case is suitable for one of my allied healthcare professionals in the practice, and in that case, you can allocate it to a nurse, or before that patient would have come straight to see you as a GP, possibly taken up a valuable slot that a nurse could have dealt with. Um, so, so, you know, that is the value, of, that's the real value of ADA for GP practices, it's the ADA Pro element. We also have ADA doctors, and we've got Shubs over here, you guys can speak to later, he's one of our clinical leads who's managing a lot of the GPs that are working for ADA. Now, we've got a large group of NHS registered GPs who are working for us part-time to conduct our chat, text chat service, so they are NHS, uh, GPs working in the NHS who want a little bit of variety in their work and we want to engage with health tech startup and you know what Belinda was talking about earlier about you know let's play it's like that is an opportunity for you guys to get involved with Ada if you like come and come and um, come and sort of do one or two consultation slots a week sorry not slots sessions a week of, of um, at a health tech company so that's another opportunity that you guys have and obviously for GP practices this can help um, to manage your excess demand if you're having trouble getting locums in or you decide you don't want locums what you can do is use the um, video consultation, sorry, the text chat consultation service with the Ada GPs instead. Um, okay, here we go. So, it's just a little bit more about the app. It's free to download. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'd mentioned that, but you know, the app is free for patients to use. This is Ada Pro. So, this will give you an idea of what you would see. So, what you would see for each patient is you would see the, the significant positive findings, the significant negative findings, and then you'll get the differential diagnoses. So, this is all helping with decision support. Um, and what you see the start of here is the text chat we say hello and that's where you can conduct your text chats you see it all on this one interface and we also capture the medical history for the patients um, so the doctors this is the end of the GPs that we talked about and so implementation very briefly how it would work is you know you would you would send a text or um, email out to one of your patients say download the, download the ADA app do an assessment before you call the receptionist um, you can, patients can then share that assessment if they want. Now, if they decide that Ada has told them it's a self-care problem, it's a self-care minor illness, they may decide not to share that assessment. So that's potentially a patient that you would have had to see that you no longer have to see. Um, otherwise, if they share the assessment, it pops up on Ada Pro, and you can then decide what to do with it next. Um, go to online consultation or um, bring them into the practice. And um, so this is just a little bit about why AI is super great, superior AI, etc. Talked about. Um, Yes, so that's everything. Thank you very much. There's a few of us here from Ada that you can have a chat with us later if you like. Because I speak to Sean if you consider doing a few sessions for us, that type of thing. So thank you very much for your time. And, uh, take care. Right, so then I'm going to invite uh, questions from the floor. So Vishal, I'd be encouraged to repeat the questions every time they come through. Sure. So we've got some from the second row there. So that gentleman in there. How does the this work medically legally? Is it just through disclaimers that any advice you give is, you know, we don't, or do you have to kind of, how, how does that work out for that point? Because you might be saying to someone, self care, but you, the nature of our trade is anything that happen. So, um, how do you get around that, or is it just through complete disclaimers? It's a very good question. So, the question was, what is the medical legal position with symptom checkers like Ada? So, if it's a patient using the app, then we use disclaimers to say that we, we basically are a health assessment service and providing sort of options for what might be wrong with you, but we don't definitively diagnose, and that's where I say we're not trying to replace doctors, we're trying to be a support tool. So if it's just a patient using the app, then we'll say that you know we have no liability. If you are concerned, and we make this clear in the app as you go through the app, if you are concerned, go ahead and see your doctor anyway. When it comes to the doctor chat service, then we are CQC registered and we passed our inspection um, and therefore we're fully compliant to provide services, in which case we are then liable if something goes wrong there with the doctor chat service. Yes. Um, so does Ada actually just play a little bit as integration? Sure. So the question was, does Ada is Ada interoperable with the GP IT systems? Very good question. We're working on it. Is the answer. <laughs> I'm sure some of you may know that it's not that easy to do, it's not easy enough to crack, but we are working on it, talking with EMIS and with System 1 to, to at the very least drop in a PDF of the ADA assessment into, into one of those system, IT systems and then in the long term actually go natively integrate, but it, it's, a, it's a journey that we have to take. Um, yes? Are you going to expand it to AD triaging and streaming? 
So the question was, we're going to expand into a and &E triage and streaming. So we already do offer good, um, a range of triage options. So there's seven different triage options, which range from self-care all the way up to call an ambulance. So we are already uh, able to work within an A&E setting. Uh, we haven't so far, but that's definitely something the triage system is able to do. And we're always looking to improve that triage system. I would say it errs on the side of caution at the moment relative to a doctor. Um, so it's just something that we're continuing to develop, but yes, it is available for sort of that type of setting. Uh, yes, sir, at the back. How would you sort of compare ADA um, with Babylon? So the question was, how would we compare ADA with Babylon? And obviously this is a question that we get a lot. Um, the honest truth is that we're coming from a different place. So Babylon came from a place of telemedicine and they're now looking to move into AI. Um, we came from a place of AI, and that's what I was trying to emphasize earlier, that it took five years to get to that place where we are in terms of AI. That journey takes a long time because there's a lot of, lot of information that an app and technology needs to have and retain within it to be suitable for this type of work. So I would say that our AI at the moment is stronger. I would say that we're leveraging machine learning through looking at cases and then feeding back to Ada what to Babylon at the moment um, with a focus on AI, and that continues to be our focus going forward. The doctor chat services is very important to us, but the real focus is the AI and the machine learning. Treatment. Yes. You said you, you um, mobilized quite a few engineers and doctors um, on the project. How exactly, at the very beginning, how exactly did you mobilize so many people in, in, in kind of joining your vision and, 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 and taking this project forward? Yes, no, it's a good question, and what we have, so we are, so I didn't mention this before, we've got two, so we're split between a Berlin office and a London office, and we have got a good number of doctors in both. The Berlin doctors were the ones to come on board first, develop the AI content, the medical content about five years ago. To be honest, there I think it was a case of just getting people very excited about the vision, about what AI, what ADA can offer and what AI can offer to healthcare in general. And you know there are always doctors and medical students out there who are not so engaged with the clinical side of things, but are more engaged with how they can make a difference in other ways. And to be honest, there are also some doctors who would prefer to have a slightly more relaxed pace of life, which comes with working in an office setting. Not if you're the founder, of course, but if you're one of the employees in a startup, then it can be slightly more low stress lifestyle. So I think there was elements of all of that for the Berlin doctors. With the <coughs> London-based doctors who work on our doctor chat service, a lot of it is that people want a variety of workplace settings. With the doctor chat service, you can actually work flexibly, so you could work from home, which obviously you can't do if you're locally at a practice. And I think it's also that ability to engage and work at a health tech company, which as you can see from this room, is just a very exciting prospect right now. And if you work as a part-time GP at Ada, then obviously you're not just doing that, you're helping us with, with our AI system, with the machine learning, and obviously getting involved in other areas as well. So I think it's quite a combination of things that Good. Great. All right, fine. Right, so awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. For that. <laughs> it's quite warm in here. <laughs> um, we've tried to fix it. I think it might be, um, it might have to stick with it. So feel free to use the program to find yourselves. It wasn't the initial purpose, but feel free to do that. Um, and we'll keep the doors open as well to keep things uh, a bit cooler. Um, thanks so much, Michelle. So we'll go on to our next presentation now. And hopefully this one should work all right. So this will be Helene from Cupris. Helene, come on up. Hi. Um, so I'm Helene. I'm from Cupris. I'm the only non-doctor there, so sorry. <laughs> uh, but the founder of Cupris is a doctor, so I think that makes the job. Um, so Cupris. Um, so Cupris was founded by Jules. Um, picture there. Jules is an ENT surgeon, and basically Jules looked for a solution to um, improve communication with patients and with the GP who refer patients to him, because he thought that a significant part of the consultation he was doing could be prevented. Had he had a picture and some medical information before. So we Paul is co-founder, they developed Cupris, and basically Cupris is uh, first, a secure communication um, platform enable, uh, enabling doctors to communicate with patients or between them. So GP can communicate with specialists and patients can communicate with doctors, GPs or specialists. Uh, but this is supported with medical devices, smartphone connected medical devices, because we think that um, communication is a key part of the assessment. When you do your uh, GP consultation or specialist consultation, you need to collect information, but it's not only about communication, it's also about the clinical examination 
and today it's quite difficult to do the clinical examination remotely. Um, so the first device we have developed is, it's not a surprise, um, and it's scope, uh, because Dr. Zania is a surgeon, and so this is a device. Uh, it's a CE marked uh, medical device, um, basically replacing the old otoscope that uh, you're probably using, or old or not so old, but the well sardine scope or anal killer that hasn't really changed for a few years um, with this attachment to the front. Um, the idea behind this is making all the communication uh, in healthcare uh, more efficient and more useful, both in to between community care and primary care and com primary care and, and secondary care. Um, so, for instance, GP can use our scope and platform with their patients. So, just to replace all the scope, so you can use it as an scope, um, benefit from a big, clearer and larger image. Then you can obviously use the camera to capture an image, engage better with the patient, show them what's wrong explain the condition, but then you can also store the image with the electronic health record. Um, so I cannot see the former speaker, but um, we've integrated with EMIS, and that was a challenge, so I'm happy to give some <laughs> uh, recommendation there, and we are all track for the process with System 1 and Vision. Um, but so basically the GP can capture the image and send it directly to EMIS. And then obviously the last step is sending this when a referral is needed, instead of sending the patient to the hospital, and then the patient has to wait few weeks um, and then arrive to the ENT consultant and realize that there is some wax, so it needs to be sent to an earwax section uh, facility first or you need to do an earring uh, assessment first to the audiologist and then the pathway is just a nightmare. So the idea is to make this pathway more efficient. G GP send the image with medical information um, to the ENT surgeon. The ENT surgeon can remotely review the case and then confirm whether or not the consultation is needed and feedback directly to the GP. Um, obviously, the benefits are uh, first enabling remote consultation with built in questionnaire. So, you can ask for second opinion. Um, GPs and patients benefit from a direct feedback attached with the image. So, it's also about empowerment of GPs and, and patients. And patients avoid going to the hospital and have to wait, wait for like long waiting lists. Uh, and obviously, the healthcare system makes savings in preventing unnecessary hospital consultations. Um, it's also a secure and compliant healthcare. Like team, team communication platform because obviously um, the platform that has been designed is IG2 compliant, so you can use it to just improve the communication either within the GP practice or with uh, GPC in ENT or with the uh, hospital consultant. And it supports education and learning uh, because you can um, explain to medical students or GP trainees what's going in the patient's ear. Um, medical legal ev evidence, uh, once more, is, is an additional benefit because you can track and store all the images um, and obviously better manage inpatient admission. Because even the patient who still needs to go to the ENT consultation, the ENT consultant has lots of information before, he has an image, he has uh, medical information and then the consultation <coughs> is more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so we started selling the Oxcope four months ago and developed the software platform. We went through all the regulation. Um, we are in the process of working on an optomscope and an Oxcope to widen the um, medical devices that you will be able to clip to your phone. Um, and we are also working on AI to be able to do some assisted diagnosis or assisted recommendation um, to kind of develop a GP toolkit. Um, so Cupris um, has received a quite a significant grant from the NHS. So for those of you who are interested in doing in innovation, um, the NHS has pushed something called SBRI, Small Business Research Initiative, and it's a grant um, to help innovators. And it's immensely helpful, so have a look at this. There are some calls every every trimester. Um, so we benefit from one of those. Uh, we are team marked IG2 compliance. Uh, we sell the device as it's a small <coughs> device in Europe, Australia, uh, South Africa, India. And we've done clinical trials to kind of assess the savings for the NHS. So we've done a net economic report with York. Um, that's something you need in the NHS if you want to provide a service to CCGs uh, or TPs. Um, and I think that's it for Cupris. So if you have any questions, please feel free.
keep that the here um, ID was first sell the device as an Scuff and GB just because it's a better Scuff than what you're using today. Um, and then we use the GB to push this new referral pathway to the CPG. So we are currently in the discussion with six CPGs. Um, we've tried to make the decision as quick and as simple for them to take. So we decided when we work with CCG, what we push is a no upfront fee um, model. So we give the auto scuff to all the GPs and the access to the platform. And they pay us only for a budget consultation. And then if the local ENT trust or ENT consultants are not interested in taking part into this, um, we are also CPC registered. So we can provide ourselves the ENT feedback to the GPs. So uh, it's obviously linked to the CCG approving this. Um, but yeah. So the next product will be a solution that fits on all phones. The main difficulty we had was uh, we used the light from the flash, and the distance between the flash and the camera is different in all Android phones. So the next product that will fit on all phones will have an LED and light source included in the device so that it can be used on any phone. What's the balance between receiving funding from the NHS to develop a product and actually turning it into a business, which might be more of a private venture? So how, what's the relationship there? How does are you allowed to do it to a certain like, How does that work? Oh yeah, we, we do whatever we want. I mean, the funding we had from the NHS, yes, you're right, was in front of a project. So you present a project, and the <coughs> project for us was hardware development from prototype to something that we can sell, software development, and clinical trial, um, and market preparation. So we had to um, explain what, how we will spend the money, and we had to spend the money the way we had uh, we had. So that's the, the only way they had pushed the business, but this is us raising the, the project. So yeah, and then I think for us um, specifically, this funding was a key part of our funding. So we only then had a crowd cube campaign last summer, uh, but this is the only two source of funding. So yeah. then I guess if you raise money with VC, then probably. But do they um, do the NHS and they There'll be opportunity later to ask. So just, a, just a quick note because uh, sure. uh, um, the FBRI uh, has launched today yeah. the next round of calls. It's our all around cancer uh, and urine diagnosis. Can yeah. you sort of look it up on the website? Okay. Thank you. So I'm Dr. Felix Jackson. Uh, I trained as a anaesthetist at the London Hospital and worked in Plymouth clinically. Um, and then I, I left clinical practice basically to do this full time. Um, we've been, it's been quite a long journey because when I set out to do it, uh, people weren't, you know, digital health, the term didn't exist. People weren't investing in digital health ideas. Um, so I ended up also creating a company called MedDigital, which is a healthcare communications agency that builds websites, apps, and does scientific content for businesses. So I'm now in a luxurious position where myself and Paul, my co-founder, who is the tech guy, um, are self-funding the development of MedCloud, which is lovely, because we don't have any venture capitalists or investors who are able to make our own decisions and take our own path. Um, we've now got to the point where we've released MedCloud, we released it online a few months ago, and we've got the apps literally about to come out. Um, and MedCloud is a compliant messaging app for healthcare teams. Um, we've realized that, um, <clears throat> If you have a look at clinical practice, uh, there's a large number of people, uh, health and care workers, uh, doctors, nurses, GPs, all sorts of people who are using WhatsApp and other non-compliant messaging apps to share clinical information. Um, I'm sure there are many of you in this room. I see a few uh, guilty smiles around the room. 
Um, and the, the point is simple, that it's not compliant for clinical information. And people are trying to anonymize it, we think, generally speaking. Um, but you can also de-identify data through a combination of factors. So it's quite, and people kind of know they shouldn't be using WhatsApp for this information. So what we've done is just develop an alternative. So you can use MedCrowd in place of WhatsApp to have clinical conversations. Um, uh, and the other thing about compliance is it's not just about security. So people say, oh, I can use WhatsApp because it's encrypted. I mean, putting aside the fact that WhatsApp isn't properly encrypted, um, there are some issues around the fact that it's not compliant with the uh, NHS IG uh, requirements. So, for example, they don't train their staff on how to handle confidential data, uh, clinical data. They don't have their servers in the UK. So if you sh were, were to share uh, uh, identifiable patient data, uh, let's say an image of a patient <coughs> test result or an x-ray with their name on it, that is stored in the US. When somebody clicks on it, on their WhatsApp to have a look at it, it's then stored in all of their um, phones, uh, photo libraries. And that is illegal unless you've got that patient's consent to do that. And I, I, I know people are doing this without patient consent to do that. So therefore, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, so the other, my, my little icons have gone a bit funny, apologies for that. So the, the, there's four things that make it, make it really good with MedCrowd and make it unique. The first is it's compliant. So we've talked about that and that's very important. The second thing which is unique is it's on topic. So the other problem with WhatsApp is you get a never ending stream of, of group messages. So you talk about patient A, then you might talk about well, what you're doing on the weekend, then you might talk about patient B, then you might share a funny joke. And if you want to go back to what, what was agreed about patient A, you've got to kind of scroll up this never ending list of messages to find it. Whereas what we do is instead of sending a message to a a group, you send a message to a conversation. So that conversation could be about patient A, the next conversation about patient B, the next conversation about funny jokes and what you're going to do on the weekend. And that collects the information into the right place. It also gives you the ability to invite different teams at different times. So you can invite one team you know, when they're on, on a ward, and then the GP team when they're discharged, or the nurse team when they're in the community. And that gives you the ability to share that information and control who sees it, which is of course different from uh, WhatsApp. And that means you can drop that information back into the clinical notes through uh, integrations. Uh, and that is fundamentally different from the way that WhatsApp and all these other messengers work. Cool, okay, so I've just put a few screenshots up here. Uh, this is the online uh, web-based platform. Um, very simple, very clean, uh, enables you to have very easy conversations with, with groups of people. Um, notifications, etc., email or mobile. Um, and then the API integrations I've already mentioned, which enable you to drop the conversations into patient notes. And we've got initial feedback from, from some GPs here um, who, who, who really like it. They, they think it's a great technology and it's the future for health and care messaging. Um, and we've got lots of advanced conversations going on. Um, I recently met a CCIO of a major um, uh, NHS trust in London um, who said, we know that everybody used WhatsApp through all the major incidents we've faced over the last few weeks but I don't want to rock the boat because I think it's, uh, you know, it's working. And I said, yeah, but if you had a compliant messaging solution, why wouldn't you switch? And I've got a meeting with them next week. You know, it's, it's absolutely no brainer for the people who are, who are running these, uh, you know, in, in charge of IG within these trusts. Um, and we've got lots of other great conversations going on. Um, the only issue is, I love this, we've launched the app without the app. So the app is due next week, or the app's due next week. So please sign up today on medcrowd.com um, and then you'll get an email from us uh, to you know when the apps are launched. And we, we're just beginning to get them into the app stores and things. And so hopefully next week the second version will come out and you'll be able to use it clinically. Brilliant. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. So Skype doesn't work across organisations. You have to be on Skype in an organisation signed up. Good question about the pricing. So the idea is that it's free for all health and care workers in the world to use, um, and then we're going to charge for the integrations. So we'll have a subscription model based on integrations. So we're, we're again, EMIS Web coming up. We're in the process of integrating with EMIS Web and getting our ISO 27001 certification. And when we've got that, we'll be able to integrate uh, with systems and charge the trusts and CCGs for that integration. 
And, and again, they're open to that. So people say, yeah, that's fine. Um, one, one thing I didn't mention sorry, about that is, is we're working with the Department of Health in Zambia. We're hoping they're going to approve our use across Zambia. <coughs> so we've got some really lovely projects that are going on as well. Gentleman down here. You said about the API, which is obviously the integration. Um, are you also open to third party developers if you rent out an API and rent out the API piece for them to develop third party apps? Absolutely. And we've got, so the question was about the API, whether we could also work with third party de developers to integrate their technology in. Medcard. The answer is yes. We've got a couple of conversations going on about chatbots. Um, so the ability to access information automatically, um, maybe something like Ada. We could, I don't know where Michelle's gone, but there's Claire over there. You know, we could integrate with that so you could ask Ada questions within our app. Those are the kind of integrations we'd love to be doing. Any questions? I think that's it for questions. Thanks so much. For
to the point that we won an award with a couple of months ago for offering two million NHS appointments uh, being served by our wonderful GP community at a fraction of the cost. So it also allows you to upload your profiles, uh, to populate your diary with all your sessions, you can see exactly what's coming, what's, what's upcoming, you can uh, bespoke your diary to set the days that you want to work, the only notifications you get are on the days that you wish, um, and it also reminds you when your, you know, your three year child safeguarding is up, your annual BLS is up, so it helps you for appraisal and validation as well. Our vision has actually grown in the last four years. We were initially uh, a startup looking to essentially find work and connect practices to GPs. Since then, the Finding Forward View has come out and we recognise that GP, the GP community is, is in a serious crisis. We know that I think 60.9% of GPs over the age of 50 are going to retire within the next few years. And sadly, statistically, if you pull a group of GPs together, about a third of them are thinking of even quitting within the next five. That's why I was asking to find out how many of you see yourself staying in the profession. So our brand has actually grown and we are looking to support GPs to enjoy, be prosperous and be supported in their G in, in, within our and obviously your GP community. I couldn't do this alone. There are a number of GPs that have helped and actually it was nice kind of going at the end because I think within most of the talks there have been GPs working with all your startups who've been working with us from, um, uh, from the beginning. So it's made for GPs by GPs. We take education very seriously and I don't mean the <coughs> sort of dusty, stiff, secondary care consultant who's kind of giving you lectures and showing you loving MRI images. It's a GP-led clinical education team and we ask you for what you want. So what's happening with tech wearables? What's happening with sleep medicine? What's happening with bioidentical hormones? What's happening with cupris? How can we evolve education to make sure it actually meets your needs? And this comes to um, also evolving how GPs learn. So we're now coaching GP societies at medical school. Um, we have had some conversations with NHS England to really be part of how we can support the GP workforce to not, to not die and how we can support you to remain happy in your profession. At the end of the day, none of us become doctors because we're money-minded. We become doctors because we actually want to help people. But in helping people, you also need to be supported and helped at the same time. We take lifestyle medicine very seriously, so we've woven that in into our educational talks and we have representatives all across the country. We've launched in Manchester, Leicester, Birmingham, and we're one, one, we are the largest online platform for, for GPs finding work in the country. So why us? I've kind of already said about what makes us good and how we've grown so quickly. <coughs> there are almost 9,000 GPs that are signed up to the site and it doesn't cost them a thing. Uh, we support them in terms of the finances that they have to, um, have to be able to um, be accountable for, and it's essentially paper light or paper free. This is what it looks like. Um, so you can type in your postcode, you can, you, know, you can actually directly chat with the practice, so you can negotiate your rate, you can say, actually, I don't want one 10 minute break or half an hour unpaid break. I want to structure my surgery the way I want to work. We also are developing an EPAC so that locums are absolutely confident and know how to manage processes before they even step into the building. It's not clinical things that let us down, it's logistics that let us down. You know, not knowing how to order a chest x-ray, not knowing um, you know, where the where the referral pathways are. Those are the things that instill um, or, or instill a lack of confidence and we're trying to resolve that before uh, GPs even walk, walk in their door. How much time? I'm down, I'm out. Uh, anyway, so what we've done is put a pack together for you. So this is coming to you because we've got a number of collaborators. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so look at this when you go home. Um, talk is taking a different spin, and yeah, that's that's us. Awesome. Thanks so much. I think we've got time for one question, and then we'll Yay. move on. And uh, my question is to all of the process group. So um, you, uh, you have fantastic solutions for GPs. How do you ensure that you reach out to GPs and they are aware of the different multitude of products that are available in App Store and so on? And how do you do 
And how do you do the same for patients? How do you educate patients to be able to understand that different products provide their different solutions and safety around the product? Yeah, so I guess I can answer question one because our product is absolutely GP and practice facing as opposed to public facing. Um, actually, no, I probably can answer question two. So feedback to clinicians to ensure they are safe is such an important part of validation and making sure doctors are good doctors. And so what we do is we support that process as it's linked to appraisals and the documents they have to complete anyway on a five yearly cycle. But when locals go into practices, they don't often think, oh gosh, I wish I'd done a multi-source feedback. Oh, I wish I'd done three patient satisfaction questionnaires. And that can make them feel even more isolated. So we've addressed that problem by being able to empower the GPs to, in real time, ask those questions, get some feedback within 24 hours, and then it automatically uploads into their appraisal or gives them the document to be able to upload. So that's a bit patient and user-facing, um, but I can't speak for our other um, startups because but maybe that's we've, we've, we've got a team of uh, advisors uh, called the MedCloud Advisors, and there are GPs on there who give us advice on how to interact with GPs. And then we reach out to CCGs and GP practices and talk to them directly at the moment with about how they'd like to use it and how to do integrations and things. As regards patients, so we're intending on doing a patient engagement program <coughs> probably through the practices that actually implement it and actually working deliberately with a group of patients <coughs> to give advice on how we should communicate about it. And very separately, um, NHS England have been doing quite a bit of work uh, to validate the app. So they've now set up an app at our NHS as library. Um, so they're still quite, you know, they're still in the beta phase and they're going to be doing quite a bit of work. I suppose they're working on their NHS choices site as well. So in time, doctor GPs will be able to direct patients to NHS apps library or NHS choices to be able to see what's available for them. GP engagement is tough because we can be quite sporadic, feisty uh, crowd, um, and we're probably quite set in our ways, um, which we're also uh, trying to change, but we run events all over the country and have uh, other organisations we work collaboratively with to, to get engagement, um, because our ethos is essentially we want to preserve primary care and really showcase all the wonderful work GPs are doing and support them to remain prosperous for their entire professional life cycle, whether they're locuming or not. It's not about making all GPs locums, it's about supporting GPs to work the way they want to work. So our site is not just for locums, it's for salaries, for partners, it's for however you wish to flexibly source your work. Excellent. Thank you so much for shining. Right, so we're almost done. Um, this segment of the event is a bit unique. So we've got in uh, Stephen and Simon, who's not here, um, essentially non-medical co-founders of a very successful health tech startup. So um, at Bain then, what she'll be doing is having a fireside chat uh, with Stephen, Sai is not with us today. And Alistair. And Alistair as well. Alistair is our clinical lead uh, and pharmacy director at Echo. So Bain is going to, uh, it's got a couple of questions for Stephen and Alistair. Now, Bain is going to stand up because she's been a surgeon in the past. Uh, how do you feel about chairs for standing up? Happy to stand. Then come on up. specifically for doctors. 
and the well-being is the key here. Um, so I'm going to start with a question about well-being. So how do you look after yourself, or is it, as a founder of Echo? Um, okay, so um, I can tell you the, the bullshit answer or the real answer. <laughs> um, it's difficult. It's a difficult balance. I think it is. I, I have uh, one of my best friends is a obstetrician in Geisel St. Thomas's, and I remember him once telling me about a 35-hour shift. I'm thinking, wow, 35 hours. I could never do that. Um, and I think the reality with a startup, and particularly in health tech, where things are just that much harder. Um, is that you will from time to time have to do some crazy stuff um, and it's really draining so um, we try and take as much time as possible to recognize burnout and make sure that we stop um, and I think someone mentioned it earlier as well is, is that the importance to, um, to celebrate the wins um, and, and just you know because it's never going to stop there's always going to be a new hurdle a new set of challenges a new random uh, issue to deal with. So just taking a minute to, to, to stop and celebrate when things go right, and they go right most of the time, um, is, is super important. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, have you got any doctor entrepreneurs in the room? You definitely do. Serena, yeah. how do you, as a doctor, yeah. how do you look after yourself? I mean, as doctors, the paradox is we're very great at looking after everyone else, but yeah. how, as individuals, it is tough. So how do you manage, especially being an entrepreneur as well? Yeah, I think uh, it's a really good question. And to be honest with you, when I was just doing doctor stuff, I didn't really look after myself very well, because I feel like we're in this institution within the NHS where you've always put everything else before you, your patients, all your responsibilities, and everything else. But actually, since I branched out into becoming an entrepreneur, I really kind of started to reflect back and kind of find that whatever our users' needs were, for example, were very similar to our needs and my needs, and then that kind of drove me to start building things that would suit their needs, which actually fit in with my needs. So I kind of felt like it builds quite a social responsibility. Um, so I personally think actually, sometimes when you step back from medicine a little bit, or kind of just sideline a little bit, it kind of gives you a bit more of an insight into how you should be looking after yourself. And I think one of the lessons that I've had is actually life's a lot more, like a lot more than just your work. Mm -hmm. You've got other aspects in it which are just as important. You know, important commodities aren't just money and finding work. It's just a lot more kind of holistic than that. Yeah. So um, I actually think it starts with yourself and recognizing that you need to take a step back and you're just as important as, as anything else. And then just starting to free up a little bit of time. Thanks very much for sharing that, Serena. Um, I'm sure we'll have a further discussion about that in the networking event, but um, thank you very much. So moving on to, as you know, most, most of the, the presenters today were clinicians, but ECHO is, was founded by two non-clinicians, which I think is so interesting kind of angle to come, come in, being it's a, it's a clinical um, platform. So tell me, what were the, the, the challenges of, of coming from a non-clinical background, but also the benefits? Well, I think, I think although um, Sai and myself are not clinicians, um, uh, we both uh, worked and have lots of personal experience um, uh, with with clinicians, and uh, we've. I mean, it's it's a bit of a cliche, but we've been patients all our lives. Um, so what brought us together is we both take the people prescriptions, and we're really frustrated by what we saw was a fragmented solution out there, um, uh, a really broken solution where you send something to the pharmacy and then it might go to the GP, and you never really know what happens. So we started there, but really um, early on we met Alistair, um, who is our clinical director and is a clinician, um, and we couldn't build what we do just on a pure consumer basis, um, consumer technology basis. There are things that you just need to consider, and now um, people like Alistair and also George who presented, who's an NHS doctor, and Abdo um, as well, help us navigate um, what's quite a tricky and sometimes impenetrable world. Because let's face it, we're not selling pizzas here, um, we're doing something that's really quite transformative. Um, and so um, you've got to get it right. Um, and you need to make sure that you're both compliant um, and that you have patient safety at top of mind. Thank you very much. And finally, as a clinician, um, selling to the NHS is one of the biggest challenges that most health tech startups have. One of their biggest dreams. How have you guys managed that? We've, we've tried to do it a few different ways. So initially we started going at all levels of the NHS. 
So right from the top, uh, sort of any regional le levels that we could think about and, and looking at individual practice. I think one of the things that we found easiest is actually looking at going direct from the patient. So when, when, when a person wants to use it, that's actually a much more compelling story to any clinician or commissioner or anything like that than we've got something we want to sell you. These are the way that your services would like to be used effectively by, by the public. And uh, the idea is that actually people vote with their feet. And enough people come along with that, you're, you're going to find it difficult to argue with it. And how many numbers did you have to come up with before you actually, the NHS said yes, we'll buy into that, or was it not about numbers game? It's not numbers, because they, different, at different levels, people will agree with the concept, or with mm -hmm. a concept, and then things change. Mm -hmm. And we've got STPs. And so CCG, what are STPs? So, the... <laughs> sustainability and transformation. So, again? Sustainability and transformation plans. It's, it's, it's a way of just carving up the map to look a little bit different, and it, it, gives, it gives the people colouring in things, something different to colour in, so that's nice. Um, and the, the, the consistently shifting political framework means that actually we, we, we keep our, our hand in, but we really try and think about who is it that needs to use this at the end of it, and who would like to benefit. We focus on that, I think, I think, you know, um, you're up, uh, absolutely just to echo what uh, <laughs> um, One of the proudest moments, I think, in the last week or so for us was um, Apple featuring our, our app as, you know, app of the week and beside Nike and all sorts of, you know, companies that we deeply admire. And, and, and when you have that and when you have the reviews and when you have that advocacy, then it makes it much easier for us to open up a conversation um, but one of the key layers, and, and the reason why we hosted this event, is, is, is to talk to GPs, is to say, look, this is one way for patients who are struggling with adherence to manage their health. Um, and um, because, because there's such a, an important, I mean, we talk about medication waste, but the real waste happens on non-adherence. Mm -hmm. The fact people mm -hmm. between a third and a half aren't taking their meds as directed, <laughs> and this is leading to much far greater issues in terms of hospitalization than just having a pack of pills at home. So um, this is the mission and um, yeah, it seems that we've got now enough users out there that um, doors are opening for us. Yeah, it's a lot of it's, it's, a lot of it's to do with unintentional non-adherence as well. So we often think that people want to try and avoid taking medication, but the vast majority, about 70% of non-adherence, is actually because people forget and yeah. life gets in the way. Mm -hmm. So if we can do things that make it easier from that point of view, mm -hmm. then we're, we're, we're hitting a much bigger market and less, less resistance. So thank you both. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left. As you know, we've been live streaming this event. We've had nearly 10,000 people watching your presentations today, which is fantastic. Um, so just to include some of the questions that we've had online. Um, so one person did ask, when is EPI going to be available in Scotland? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, yeah. Uh, we're working on it, um, is, all, is all I can say. Um, we really, really want to roll out to Scotland. As I'm sure most people in this room know, there isn't one NHS. Um, there's in fact four NHS, um, because Northern Ireland, Wales, England, and Scotland all operate separately of different systems, but um, it's a priority for us. Okay, awesome. The next question is a general question to any of the startups that presented today. Um, can, how can GPs promote these apps? <laughs> on behalf of Lambton, we have very active social media presence. Um, you'll see in the slides that you get later on, but we've got a very active Facebook group. Um, we've also got our community champions who have encrypted WhatsApp uh, conversation groups. So if you're in Northwest London, you can find, um, find jobs or wherever you are. So your social media is probably the best way to engage. I think, I think actually, um, although social media is great, I think word of mouth is actually a really empowering thing. Um, I think when GPs speak to other GPs and connect kind of face to face, except, you know, aside from an online forum, it's actually a really powerful thing. And I think also a lot of the knowledge that we need, social media is one thing, but I think having something kind of directly come to you or being able to directly access it, where it will then lead on to a network of other bits of information is again, really important because I don't know about you guys, but I'm quite sick of Facebook. <laughs> And also WhatsApp, like, if you look at my phone, like many other GPs, you, you've got so many streams of messages, you're just like, 
okay, I'll just mute that thread, I'll mute that thread. And I think there's often just a complete bombardment of information. I think there's got a lot to be said with GPs. We communicate, like we're taught to do this 10 minute power consultation. We should be the kings and queens of communication. And I think actually just sharing that knowledge person to person is a really, really powerful thing. Okay, thank you very much, Serena, and thank you, Alistair and Stephen. Yeah, yeah, yeah.